can't stand when they put English subtitles to my English voice. I just say the word I see them written. Why should I distort them to make the audience understand them? Take the word possible, for instance. I see it as I see it, possible. Yet no one understands me. I mean, I'm sure they understand, but mock my accent. In order to have a proper pronunciation, I should have to destroy the writing before I read the word. Possible. The worst of all words is milk. Milk, milk. No one ever gets me until I squeeze an imaginary breast, which can be considered inappropriate. Now that the subtitle situation has been explained, I can start the story. For a couple of years, I had a stormy, episodic relationship with the independent comic book world. I had several attempts in merging my 24 frames per second work into its several frames per page world. I had noticed that the archetype of the female independent comic book artist is shy and egomaniac, discreet and self-obsessed at once. Pardon my generalization, but it's based on a single example. Example that painfully aborted my collaborative ambition. Nevertheless, this trait of personality gave me the idea to put the author back physically in his own drawing. So I went to another graphic novel artist, the best of all, Julie Doucet, to propose my idea and we started a long list of emails. I tried to explain to her what I had in mind. I wanted to make a film with her drawings, but the picture would not move at all. Only one character, her, would come to life on video. So we needed an actress to play her. It has to be her, or the self-centered concept will make no sense at all. First she said, no, no, no. Why not, I insisted. She said, you can't be serious. Oh God, no, oh God, forget it. Not a good idea. She felt she could never act. She would look ridiculous, stiff, stupid, slow. I realized that my generalization was wrong. Julie was only self-centered on the paper, not in the real world. And it was more about composition or point of view than ego. Of course, I denied all her arguments. I said that her stiffness would play in her advantage, etc. I couldn't see my ID die a second time. And I acted as if I knew what I was doing, which is 90% of the director's job. Before she had time to say definitively no, I suggested she'd buy a tape recorder to put her voice in the movie. I made it sound very naive so she would not see the trick. And I asked her to start recording sounds on her voice. At last this film has a voice and I can be quiet now. Uh, one, two, one, two. Uh, testing, testing the machine. Oh, I forgot to say that she had to come to New York to shoot her part, and the journey would be the story of our film. The next day, I started to work on the film. And the day after, and the day after, the day after, and so on and so on, until the day I was leaving. It was then time to pack up my bags. I was scared. Am I really doing this? I can't believe I'm doing this. The next morning, like a good girl, I arrived at the bus station an hour in advance. I wanted to make sure I'd get a seat by a window. Well, it turned out there were too many passengers for the bus. Along with a dozen of very pissed off people, I was forced to wait for the next one. <coughs> I had two hours and a half to kill. I went to the public library across the street to use a computer to send an email to Michelle. Then I ran my horoscope on 100 different websites. At last we got on the bus. I got two seats all by myself. A nice and quiet trip. Until we got to New Jersey. We got stuck in a huge traffic jam. 
It took one hour to get out of it and off the highway. Drank too much yesterday. I, I swear I'm not gonna drink again. Like Just the thought of Michelle waiting for me for two hours at the bus depot got me hysterical. The delay, the lateness. To my big surprise, there he was, waiting for me, even looking happy to see me. I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, it's not my fault, but I... No, I you're going to have to be sorry, but that I saw a million of faces. We took a cab, we went to Michel's place. During the trip, he told me all about what we were supposed to do. It sounded like it was quite a lot of things to do. So, welcome, Julie. We go to shoot Julie on a blue screen. At the studio, uh, it was supposed to be just me and him, and that there were ten other people. I was just freaking out. I just thought he was such a, a bastard. Okay, Julie. Oui. Uh, action. At this point, Julie becomes real. Jean Louis was the cameraman. He was supposed to be a real pro and doing a good job, which was a good thing because I knew I'd be so horrible. I didn't know what would happen in the future. It was like being in a rough time travel machine or something. Then we go to visit the Oxbury, the camera stand to shoot the drawings. We go to eat. We're having a conversation. Which I didn't know what would happen in the future, which didn't make any sense to me. I expected Michelle's house to be a huge house, a huge uh, movie director's house, like in Hollywood. But no, no, it was just a Brooklyn house. <laughs> My bedroom was tiny but pleasant. He had bought for me new towels with tiger heads embroidered on them to match with the tiger carpet. And my uh, friend Jean-Louis, he was very jealous. He's like, oh yes, you did nothing for my room. But his room is bigger and better. It, it was just already there. The room I had to organize it a little bit. Then I got to meet Michel's son, Paul, and Jean-Louis. And here you can see my son. Paul, this is Julie. He's a big fan of yours. J'aime bien le soir regarder un petit bout de film avant de me coucher et me croquer un bout de, de beef jerky et, et c'est pour ça qu'il ressemble à un beef jerky et, euh, et de manger des, des petits gâteaux. C'est pas des petits gâteaux, c'est des bouts de viande. Non, non mais il y a aussi euh, des petits gâteaux salés. Ça c'est moi qui les pique. Je mérite. Alors lui me pique mérite et Paul me pique le beef jerky. Il est passé dans la station service. Non. Ah non, tu l'as oublié. Attends, là, je le coche. 7 dollars et il n'y a pas assez de viande là-dedans. Tu n'as pas touché la, la boisson de la C'est toi qui l'as bu. Ah oui, voilà. Non, mais voilà. Voilà ça. ce que, que Jean-Louis fait boire à mon fils. Mais non. Oh, c'est le voisin qui me l'a offert. Il a mis ça ici, etc. Et c'est Paul qui l'a sifflé. Je ne l'ai même pas goûté. Je ne sais même pas quel goût ça a. Mais ça a dit l'attente. I felt like I was in the Gondry's reality show. It was a madhouse. But it was great. We went to bed kind of late. It had been a long day. Michelle had promised me if by any chance I'd have a dream, he'd make an animation film out of it. The next morning, Michelle made the breakfast for us. On the menu were Aunt Jemima powder pancakes. The pancakes had a bit of a special burnt taste. They were served with the Aunt Jemima corn syrup. An intern was piling up 20 used pizza boxes at the same time. Many bad jokes later, it was time to start the day. Michel called a cab. Paul went to school to do his high school diploma exam. 
we went to the Roosevelt Island cable car. Michel needed to shoot images of city landscapes for another video he was doing. How many projects he is working on at the same time, I don't know. We were worried that the cable car operator wouldn't let us film because of the ambient terrorist paranoia. Michel was picking on Jean-Louis because Jean-Louis had a t-shirt advertising a film brand on, despite Michel's orders to be as discreet as possible. You haven't understood, it's because this morning I thought we were going to film in the middle of a vitre and I put a white t-shirt and I said you never understand it. Yeah, but you're completely débile with a t-shirt of a cameraman professional. They quarreled about this and that, all the way to the island. We walked around a bit on Roosevelt Island. We looked at the water, at the buildings on the other side, at the school where Paul was doing his exams. Back in Manhattan, we had lunch at a moonstruck restaurant. Michel kept on bugging John B. Un des premiers souvenirs de Jean-Louis, il avait euh, acheté une boîte de euh, haricots verts. Il avait euh, une pas mal de fils dans les haricots verts et euh, il les a euh, renvoyés à Bonduelle en se plaignant. Il a reçu un, un carton de plein de produits Bonduelle et une lettre d'excuse. Moi je lui ai dit qu'il devait faire un bouquin de toutes ces lettres de plein. De quand, quand, quand il passe un mauvais voyage à Air France, il écrit toujours une lettre. We went to New Jersey to this animation film studio to take pictures of my drawings for our project. The place was truly a camera museum. Jean-Louis, his eyes were popping out of his head with wonder and jealousy. The animation bench we were using to photograph my drawings that won't even move was this huge machine that looked way too big for what it was supposed to do. Too many knobs, too many buttons. The whole system was controlled by what looked like a 20 years old computer. It kind of felt like being in an old science fiction movie. The job done, we went and sat at a terrace to drink a few cold and well deserved Bon alors maintenant nous on parle, on parle pas mais par contre tu regardes bien autour la ville. Alors monte bien quand tu enregistres le truc. That night I was lucky enough to have a dream which didn't happen to me for a long time. I'm going to what looks like a temple. I have to buy a ticket to go in. There is a lot of people. A strong light is coming out of the door, like I am going to heaven. The next day in the evening, with Michel, we went to the gentleman's club. We met in front of the place with a friend of his, Choco. We ordered beer, took our sketchbooks out. Choco started to draw right away. My drawing skills were a little rusty, so I had a slow start. Michel was giving one dollar bits to the girls so they'd come closer to him so he could draw them better. I expected the girls to be so kinky, so lecherous, but no, not at all. Maybe I heard too many dirty jokes in the last couple of days to be shocked by the show. Michel seemed a lot more susceptible to it all, I'd say. He got a message from one of the girls. He offered me one. I said no, but then yes, when the massage girl asked. It was nice. She did a good job, really. In the end, it was a fun, interesting evening. The next day, I decided to go to Washington Heights. That's where I used to live. That was in 1991. I hadn't been there since I moved out of there. Nothing had changed, really, except for the stolen, burnt cars lying around on the street. They were not there anymore. I have never seen one actually burning. We weren't going out in the neighborhood at night. 
garbage that was on the other side of the street is gone. The people live to throw their garbage bags out of their windows. I went inside. The hall and the stairs had been repainted with happy and soft colors. The mailboxes had been repaired. At the time they had been smashed open, so we had to go get our mail at the post office. I went up the stairs. I realized that I didn't remember my apartment number, not even which floor I lived. I looked out of the window to try to figure it out. It looked about right. But was it? Could it be that door? My mind was blank. I had bought some groceries on my way back from Washington Heights. The fridge at Michelle's place is always empty. Michelle eats cookies in the middle of the night and Paul, I don't know. By the way, do you have uh, bought some beers? Of course, I did. Yeah. Later that evening, we watched an old Louis de Funès movie. No, I don't know, no? I don't understand. How with me, you pick up Peter? No, you, you don't want me to pick up the kid. No, 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 you, you. you. The next morning it was time to leave to go back to Montreal. Michel and Jean Louis took me to the bus depot. For the two of them, the work was done. It was not really my case. I ended up with masses of drawings to do. I mean, tons of drawings, yes. It was time for me to leave. Which is not entirely true. I had to do a lot of work after she left. Mm -hmm.